Got some coffee. coffee warmed up. Ice water. <clears throat> now, if you're thinking the heat's not working because we didn't pay the bill, that's not the not the reason. Something's wrong with the thermostats, but uh, that's okay. I like it this way personally. <clears throat> it's encouraging to see hardly anybody here. <laughs> it sounds kind of weird, doesn't it? Annual uh, conference, couples conference is this weekend, and it looks like a lot of couples went, so I'm encouraged with that. And uh, talked with uh, Adam this, uh, this morning after Rebecca, and they're encouraged, and things are going well down in Tantara. So. Anyway, we're going to have a good time ourselves. How many of you guys are directionally challenged? How you don't know where north or south is, east or west. Maybe you've lived in this town all your life, but you still don't know how to get to Grandma's house. That kind of thing. How many are in that camp? A few of us? Yeah, I've got a couple of daughters like that. Won't mention any names. But, you know, we got all kinds of devices, don't we, to get us where we need to go. Is that correct? MapQuest, you know, we all got our iPhones. You can Google just about any place, and they'll get you directions. There are GPSs. GPSs. My older brother, I golf with him from time to time, and he's got a golf caddy GPS. <laughs> sets it on his cart as we're driving and it tells you exactly how far you are from the hole. This trap is 110 yards. Man, it is awesome. It does everything to swing the club for you. Anyway. I have for that too. Yeah, you need an app for that too? Alright, cool. Those kind of things help us do what? Get to a destination. Is that correct? That's how they get us there. How many have heard of Roy Regals? Anybody hear of Roy Regals? He was the center for the California Golden Bears in 1929. And I ran across this story about old Roy. I'd like to share with you this morning. His name was etched into the uh, society into football history as the number one bonehead of all times. Here's what Roy encountered. He forgot which way to run with the football. In a span of about 10 seconds, Regal cost his school the victory in the 1929 Rose Bowl. He made himself out to be a legend, a bumbler, with the new nickname of Wrong Way Regals. It all began in the second quarter of a scoreless tie between his team, the Golden Bears of California, and the Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets. Tech was running the ball, and Stumpy was hit on the, his own 36-yard line, and he fumbled. The ball bounced to the Tech 40 with both teams in hot pursuit. During the wild scramble for the loose ball, Regals, the California center, picked it up out of the air, and he started running down the field in the right direction, and was only 30 yards away from a touchdown. When he got hit and he got turned around and spun, and he started running again, but this time in the wrong direction, to the opponent's goal line. He run, ran down the field so fast in the wrong direction that no one could hardly catch him. Now, centers aren't supposed to run that fast. <laughs> but he looked like a man possessed, is what the announcer said. He was pumped with so much determination that no one had a chance to catch him. Some of his teammates were fooled by his misguided attempt at glory, and they began knocking down Georgia Tech tacklers. Can you imagine that? The legendary sports broadcaster, Graham McNenemy, who was calling the play-by-play -play on radio, couldn't believe his eyes. What's the matter with me, he said. Am I going crazy or what? Tech players on the bench jumped up and down and began to shout, Coach, he's running the wrong way. And of course, he told them to, quiet, quiet, what are you guys trying to do here? Let's see how far he will run. Regals would have gone all the way if he hadn't been for the clear thinking of their quarterback, of his quarterback. 
Benny Lam immediately chased his teammate down, shouting, Stop, Roy, stop, you're going the wrong way. And at the 10-yard line, he caught Regals and slowed him down enough to get tackled on the one-yard line. He shrieked out, you let me, almost let me make a touchdown. Why didn't you let me make a touchdown? <clears throat> and Lom informed, in, in, uh, he, uh, informed him that he was running the wrong way. Regals ran 70 yards the wrong way. The wrong direction. He sat down on the ground and couldn't believe what he had just done. How many of us have and are running the wrong way sometimes. And we need a change of direction. We need someone to redirect us so that we get to where we're going. I want to take a few minutes this morning to talk with us about the importance of going in the right direction. And not only that, but following those directions now, I don't know about you, but sometimes I can print out a MapQuest direction line by line, and I have a tendency to want to deviate from it. <laughs> but it's important not to only have the directions, but also follow them, is it not? Let's pray and ask God to touch, read, speak, encourage, build <clears throat> us this morning. Father, we thank you for your word this morning, for it is the truth. We pray, Lord, that you would touch us this morning, you would open up our eyes, you would speak to us, Lord. Your word, Lord, is able to correct maybe a direction we're going. It's able to encourage us, Lord, in the directions we are going. Your word is able to Build us up and strengthen us where we need to be strengthened. I pray that your word today would be spoken accurately, Lord. I need your help this morning to communicate what you put on my heart, what you're showing me. And so I just ask God you would speak today loudly. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I was given a book a couple months ago, <clears throat> written by Andy Stanley, called The Principle of the Path. I read a good portion of it recently and was stimulated by a number of things that Andy Stanley wrote and related them to my own life and some of the paths I'm on, some of the things I'm encountering, some of the destinations I'm in pursuit of. And in this book, he lays out that we are all on a path. Whether you like it or not, life is full of paths. And they're leading somewhere. There is a final destination in mind in the paths that we're on. He recalls the story of the Wizard of Oz. You all are familiar with that? I've seen it maybe as a kid, maybe even seen it really recently, but you find Dorothy, and she's away from home. And she has a desire to get back there. Does she not? Where does she want to go? I know that's hard for you to say. <laughs> she needs to get back and wants to get back to Kansas. Are they playing Missouri tomorrow, by the way? Is that what's happening here? So that's her destination. She wants to get back there, right? And so she runs into Glinda, who is the good witch of the East, supposedly. And she tells her that she needs to seek assistance from the Oz, from the great Oz in the Emerald City. Kind of how the story goes. So Dorothy says, okay, how do I get there? How do I get there? And Glinda tells her to stay on the yellow. yellow brick road. That's your path to the Emerald City. Stay on the yellow brick road. Follow that path and we'll get you to this destination. We'll get you to the place where you need answers on how to get to Kansas. 
And as long as she stayed on that road, she would get there, right? But in the midst of on that road, she runs into a number of things. A number of distractions. A number of trials. Isn't that kind of like life? It's full of those things, and there's things that we encounter that are inevitable. Now, wouldn't it be great if there was a yellow brick road? <laughs> For us that are married, that lead to the best destination. Wouldn't it be great if there was a yellow brick road that led you to financial security? Never had to worry about money again. And if you just followed that yellow brick road, it would be positive. You would have success. Or if you have children, if there was a yellow brick road, that they would turn out exactly the way you want them to be. Is there such a thing? Andy, in his book, says that there are paths that lead us to these destinations. And there are also paths that lead us away from those destinations. He says that we win or lose in life by the paths we choose to follow. Yours and my destinations in life are determined by a sequence of decisions we make on a daily basis. The decisions we make today affect the future. They affect where we're headed. And so it's important to know what decisions we make today and where they lead us to. Here's an example. Your current financial status and situation right now where you're at most often has been created by little choices you have made or not have made. You've been on a path that have given you, that have placed you right now in a destination in that area alone. Now there are some things that are out of our control, I understand that, but a majority of where we're at in areas of life have been, on, been based on little decisions, little paths we have taken. That's kind of the idea here behind this principle of the path and the same is true for all kinds of areas. I want to take a look at some of those. You've got an outline there in front of you. I'm going to touch on some of these. We're going to look at a few things that keep us from being successful in getting to the destination we want. And then some keys, some ways, some principles on how to get to that destination we desire. The direction that you're currently traveling in all these areas that I have on your paper, <coughs> the decisions you make will determine where you're at in these areas. Now, Andy also makes a, a, a distinction here. He has a little note, and I agree with this 100%, that our intentions, our aspirations, our hopes, our dreams, our desires, even our intellect, those are all nice. Those are all part of our makeup. And they're helpful. But they do not, in and of themselves, determine our destination. I can have all the intentions in the world, but they may not and probably won't get me to my destination until I make the choices along the road. Does that make sense? We can desire all kinds of things. But our ultimate destination is based on the directions we take, on the paths we decide to follow. That's the idea behind it. Direction, not intentions, lead us to our destination. So where are you at in your current destination when it comes to friendships? What does that look like in your life? Where are they headed, the friendships that you have or the friend that you are? Are you the kind of friend that you want in your friendships? 
to others? Are you a friend who sticks closer than a brother, as the Bible says? Where there's no separation, we are blood, you are my brother to the end? Or do we dismiss people? Do we disregard them? Are we at odds with them? Are you choosing the right company in your friendships? You may have the greatest intention, but bad company corrupts good morals. They affect you. How about your spiritual maturity? Where will it end up in your life? What destination is there in your spiritual maturity? Do you desire to be godly? To have a deep relationship with God? Is that your intention? But what do you do every morning when you get up? Do you read the newspaper? Do you look on the internet? Or do you get in God's Word? That direction determines and will determine your destination in this area. What about your marriage? Are you married? Are you a married woman who wants to have a great relationship with her husband? Is that an intention? But then you place the children as a priority rather than your husband. What about if you're a husband who wants his wife to respect him, but she finds him flirting with the women in the neighborhood. That's a path, a direction that he may be taking. What about your parenting? Are you a parent who desires that your children develop a personal relationship with God? To have friends that desire the same? But you get up on a Sunday morning and rather than going to church, you maybe head to the lake. What about your finances? How many would like to be financially secure? Wouldn't that be wonderful? What path are you on to see that happen? What decisions are you making along the way? Are you living beyond your means? What's your attitude towards debt? all have a bearing on that destination. What about eternal life? Where are you headed there? Life is but a mist, a vapor, and then it's gone, the Bible says. How many have ever played hide and seek? <clears throat> Good old-fashioned game where one counts the whatever it is, and then they say what? Ready or not, here I come. You know, death is kind of like that. <laughs> Ready or not, here it comes. And where is your destination? Where are you headed there? Have you made a choice to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior? There's a destination, heaven or hell. What about your health? <clears throat> How many would like to live healthy? <laughs> I would. How are we attaining that? What does that look like? What path are we on to remain as healthy as possible? Education. All these areas have destinations. Now here are some things that keep us from arriving successfully at some of these destinations. First thing I have here is a lack of vision. Proverbs 29 18 <clears throat> tells us that where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Some people have no idea where they want to be in these areas. They have no idea they don't have any goals. They don't even have any intentions or desires in some of these areas. So what may keep us and will keep us from being successful is not knowing where we're going. 
So how in the world are we going to know how to even get there? So a lack of vision will keep us from being successful. Without a vision, people perish. Without a vision, people are without aim. We're truly going to 1 Corinthians 9. Gives us a very clear picture of what this looked like. Paul exhorting the church in Corinth to not live aimlessly, to not live without some kind of vision, without some kind of goal. And he says this, starting in verse 24, Do you not know that in our race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Folks, we are in a race. The human race. <laughs> it is going on. And there is a path that each of us are on in the human race. Run in such a way as to get the prize. I haven't done much running in my day, at least for competition's sake. But yet there's often a goal, is there not? There's a finish line. That's the vision. That's what you need to keep your eyes on. And everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. There's discipline involved to get to that goal. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. Without knowing where the finish line is, it's tough to get there, is what he's saying. Don't run aimlessly. Have goals, have a vision. I do not fight, Paul says, like a man beating the air. I've not been in a boxing ring. I've been in a, on a wrestling mat. But I don't just wrestle the air. I just don't beat the air. I have a goal. I have a vision. Paul says, no, I beat my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Not having vision can keep us and will often keep us from <coughs> arriving successfully. The second area that I think keeps us from arriving successfully is this word called procrastination. It's a Latin word, two words. Pro means of, and crastinus means tomorrow. Of tomorrow. That's what procrastination is. I will do it tomorrow. It's a killer. <laughs> it robs us from making progress. It has destroyed relationship after relationship. Procrastination. It has kept students, robbed students of moving forward academically. I will do it tomorrow. It's the number one reason why men and women are not in heaven today. I will do it tomorrow. What's God say today? Today is the day for salvation. Today, not tomorrow. Today. How often does that word tomorrow come up? In your own life. I'll start my homework tomorrow. I will start saving tomorrow. I'll quit smoking tomorrow. Fill in the blank. I'll make that phone call tomorrow. I will give my life to God tomorrow. I'll get help with that area I'm struggling with. Tomorrow. James 4.14. Why? I think that's a question to ask ourselves. Why? Why tomorrow? He says, why? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. 
what is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. I often see, and I've done it myself, that procrastination, procrastinators are full of excuses. Come up with all kinds of things to validate why they're not doing what they're doing. In Luke chapter 14, Jesus talks to a bunch of people about following him. And they come up with excuses. The main thing that keeps people from following him is their many excuses, is what it says. One says, I have bought a field, excuse me. I just bought some oxen, excuse me, God. I gotta go take care of them. I, I just got married. Please excuse me. Laziness is another procrastinator's direction. You're just lazy sometimes. I know that full well. I've been lazy at times and put off things. I'll get more involved when things settle down. Guess what, folks? I have not found where things have settled down yet. <laughs> we fill it up, don't we? Number three. Another thing that keeps us from becoming successful in these destinations is that we live in design. And what I mean by this is this is where you go with the flow. It'll all work itself out. You're a rafter versus a rower. A rafter, you're just on a raft and you're just drifting. You're just going with the flow. Whatever happens, happens. Versus a rower where you're at work and you're trying to get somewhere. You have a destination. That's kind of the idea here. I sure hope my marriage makes it. Is living life by default versus design. If I have some money left over at the end of the week, I will drop some in the offering basket. Could characterize a life by default versus design. I am in school and I'm not sure what I am majoring in. Could be part of that picture. I will share my faith when it is convenient. When I have nothing else going on. Ecclesiastes is a good book to read. Especially chapter 1. When it talks about living a life by default versus design. It says in the first part of Ecclesiastes 1. That we uh, can live our lives by default. And our lives will seem meaningless will seem empty. Your life will be full of futility. You ever been on a treadmill? How, how, where are you going? <laughs> Nowhere. It's just going round and round and round. You ever feel like your life has been, is that way? Maybe you're living life by default versus design. Ecclesiastes 1 also tells us we will have no satisfaction or significance if we live our life by default versus design. In my remodeling business, I have on many occasions had to work with interior designers and architects where they present a design by which to follow as a template. Our life should be characterized like that. Have a template, a design for areas of your life in order to reach that destination. I'm just not, I just often just don't walk into a bathroom remodel job and they just tell me, do whatever you want to do. 
You figure it out. Just surprise me. No, it doesn't happen that way. <clears throat> Life shouldn't happen that way. Ephesians 5, verses 15 and 16 <clears throat> encourages us to do this. It says, be very careful. That word careful means intentional. Be very intentional. Don't leave it by default. Be very careful then how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise. Making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. So what path, what design is there in some of these areas? What design are you following? Let's go to some keys to arriving successfully. Some keys that help us get to the destination that we desire, that we have intentions for. The first is to have a plan. Proverbs 21.5 tells us good planning and hard work lead to prosperity. <clears throat> but hasty shortcuts lead to poverty. Map out a plan, a design, a path that will lead you to a desired destination. One that you desire, one that you have intentions for. Map it out. What does it look like? In your marriage, in your finances, in your health, in your education. Work hard at gathering resources, information, knowledge, accountability. Accountability is huge. That will get you to the desired destination in your walk with God, in your service, in the community, to the church, to others. If you want to lose weight, have a plan. It may take some hard work over here at the ark from time to time. If you want to grow spiritually, find some accountability partners. Learn what it means to study the Bible. Get some help, some encouragement. Have a plan. If you want to improve your grades, what are you going to have to do? Knuckle down. You're in high school now. Get some good grades so that your GPA is up here so you can get a good scholarship. Don't leave it to fate. If you want to get a handle on your finances, what do you need to do? What's the plan? What's the plan? When you've developed a plan, submit it to God. Proverbs tells us that a man plans his course, a man plans his ways, but the Lord determines the steps. Submit it to him. The second key to arriving successfully is place God at the center. Place God at the center. He's the Oz, so to speak. <laughs> He's got the answers. <coughs> This portion in Joshua has encouraged me over the years. <clears throat> it says this in Joshua 1. It says, be strong and very courageous. I watched the movie Courageous the other night for the first time. It was very stimulating, very encouraging. It takes courage to make changes, to make decisions, to have a plan, does it not? We're going against the Some of us may need to do some drastic changes to get off this path and get on this one. That takes courage. That takes strength. We need God's help to go against the flow. Some people may think that you're overreacting. Let them think it. 
Be strong and very careful. There's the careful word again. Be intentional. Oh, thanks, sir. Give attention. Be careful. To obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left. Don't get off the yellow brick road. God has a path. He's got a road he wants us to walk. And it takes obedience. It takes submission. Don't get off of it. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night. That takes work. That takes work to meditate on God's word, to know what it says, to obey it. Does it not? Is it easy for anybody here? It's not for me. So that you may be careful so that you may be intentional to do everything written in it. It's a path, is it not? It's a direction. God is our map quest for life. Read it, know it, follow it. Then what? You will be what? Miserable? Bankrupt? be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you be strong and courageous? There it is again. It takes courage. It takes God's strength. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. The Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Walking right down that path with you. Sometimes pulling you along. Sometimes kicking you in the pants. Wherever you go. And the third key is pray. Pray. Talk to God. It's a discipline. It's hard work. But it's necessary. God listens to our prayers. God answers our prayers. God wants us to speak with him. Genesis chapter 24. Master, he prayed, give me success and show kindness to my master. God, I want success. Help me to know what that looks like. What does that mean? What do I need to do to get there? What do I not need to do to get there? What should I stay away from? Give me success. God wants to give us success. Help me to accomplish the purpose of my journey. God has given us a purpose. He has a plan for each one of us. He has a purpose for why he put us into why we're breathing yet still today. Ask him what it is. Help. Ask for his help. Verse 42, same chapter. So this afternoon, when I came to the spring, I prayed this prayer. O oh Lord, the God of my master Abraham, if you are planning to make my mission a success, please guide me in a special way. Back to the path. Guide me. Don't let me get off your path. Help me. Courage me. Show me. Discipline me. Strengthen me. Give me courage. Guide me in a special way. Pray. Pray. Pray Wednesday mornings at 6.30 here. 
Pray Sunday mornings at 8.30 here. Opportunities. You don't have to, to come to those times. Pray. Pray at noon on Wednesdays. Pray. George Mueller was a man who believed in prayer. Powerful prayer. In the course of his ministry to the orphans of England, he never asked, never asked, it says, for financial assistance from men. Only of God. Only of God. And he constantly received what he was needed. What was needed. Once while he was on his way to speak in Quebec for an engagement, on the deck of the ship that was to carry him to his destination, he informed the captain that he needed to be in Quebec by Saturday afternoon. As the captain related the story, he said this, It's impossible. Sorry. Can't get you there. Do you know how dense this fog is out here? We can't see a thing. George said, no, he replied. I don't see it. My eye is not on the density of the fog, but on the living God who controls every circumstance of life. I have never broken an engagement in 57 years. Let us go down into the chart room and pray. He knelt down and he prayed one of the most simple prayers, the captain said. When he had finished, I was going to pray, but he put his hand on my shoulder and told me not to pray. As you do not believe, he said, so don't even pray. <laughs> you do not believe but I believe he has already answered. I looked at him and George Mueller said to me, Captain, I have known my Lord for 57 years and there has never been a single day when I have failed to get an audience with the king. Get up, Captain, and open the door and you will find that the fog has gone. Wow. Captain got up, and the fog indeed was gone, and on that Saturday afternoon, George Mueller kept his promised engagement. He prayed like that. Prayer. Powerful. Let's pray. Father, to believe what I believe. Father, we thank you that you're listening right now to each one of us. You know every one of our thoughts at the same time. That every one of us, Lord, can speak to you at the same time and you will know what we're saying. Thank you, Lord, for that quality about you. I pray, Father, that you would guide us. I pray, Father, that we would have the desire to allow you to guide us. That we would give up on the paths maybe we're taking. That you would redirect us on the way we should go. I pray, Lord, for strength, for courage to make some changes if we need to or to keep going the way we're going, Lord. Many of us are on the right paths. 
But we need the strength to keep going at times. I pray, Father, that if anyone here today is struggling with whether they have given their life to you or not, that they would do that. That they would surrender and give their life to the Savior. They would trust in what you did for them on the cross rather than all good works. I thank you, Lord, that you are always for us. You will be with us wherever we go. We need help, Lord, to follow the law, to obey you, to do things that are difficult sometimes. I pray, Lord, that you would free any of us, Lord, that are struggling with areas that don't please you. I pray, Lord, that we would seek help in areas that we need help in. Father, I thank you for your grace, God. I thank you that you love us no matter what. Your desire, Lord, is to be glorified in and through us, and Lord, we need your help in that. Thank you, Lord, for this word, and ask God that it transform us to be more like yourself.